You guys ready to get started? So I'm Scott Thompson. I'm actually an account rep for uh, the Corn Ferry account here at Domo. And super excited to have uh, Foley over here, you know, do his presentation. The interesting part about this and me being up here is uh, the account executive who asked me to do this, uh, she had some last minute things come up. She, uh, she says, hey, um, I, got some, I got some meetings I gotta go to and will you do the intro for Corn Ferry? I'm like, oh yeah, great. You know, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll do that. She's like, you're not nervous, are you? I'm like, no. She's like, oh good, because the last time you were on stage, you were half naked anyway. Now I got your attention, don't I? Uh, it's not what you think. <laughs> um, but now that I do have your attention, um, yeah, super excited. Uh, Foley here is, I think he's a little bit of a prodigy. He'll never tell you that. Uh, he's a self-taught Python. Um, so not to mention, who here is a, uh, a Domo, not a Domo customer yet. Who's a prospect? Anybody here? Raise your hand. Wow, that's impressive. Nobody. Anyway, uh, fully here last year um, and his team were actually prospects uh, for Domo. And so they've had and implemented Domo about nine, nine months ago, I think, last May. Um, so super impressive he's here to present. Um, so, without further ado, give it up for uh, M. Foley. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Foley. Uh, thank you for coming to the last session. Uh, this is your last chance to drop the people's elbow and I will hopefully be your guide on this. Um, one thing I do want to note, this is the data science, I mean, sorry, this is the machine learning and AI track. And while we'll go over Python and some pandas and we'll be hacking ETL and doing lots of fun things, doing aggressive normalization to clean data, we're gonna be more on machine yearning than actual full-on machine learning. So with that, just to kind of go over what we're gonna cover today. So for background, we're just gonna go on over why I'm coming from the marketing department at Corn Ferry. Um, the stuff that we're gonna cover could apply to any department, any type of business, um, but it's just good to have the background to work through the examples we're going through and why Python specifically is really good at solving these challenges. The good news is democracy is not dead yet. Uh, native scripting in the uh, ETL allows eager departments to really punch above their weight. Uh, and we're gonna work through a sample project where we're gonna do boss normalizations for non-coders. So we're gonna walk through ways to hijack Domo Detail components as a mini user, mini, mini user interface. Uh, we'll step through a very simple process first with pandas to do normalizations. And then we'll, we're just gonna slowly step that up to do more advanced use cases with dictionaries and other data structures. Uh, we'll then go on the other side to see how we can set up some quick tiles to allow people to archive and shape data for optimized card building, and then really just build it in a way that users can take the wheel. Uh, we'll end with covering some advanced applications of this. Uh, one thing that we've been working on is a fuzzy match Ocalypse. I don't know how much of you, how many of you have worked with fuzzy matching. It can be a nightmare, but many of the things that we can use in Python, write in ETL can solve a lot of these problems. And we turned on our prototype recently and found 45 million that we didn't realize we even had in marketing attribution. So that spurred at least two weeks of just making sure we even had it right. Um, but it all looked good, so we're, we're now working to you know, scale that up. So just a little bit about Corn Ferry, a global organization consulting firm. Uh, we work. Uh, for a wide range of things for a lot of HR consulting, but also you know, uh, executive recruitment, and uh, here are some numbers that we have. I'm just trying to be conscious that we're not going to, we're gonna honor the pledge not to hawk our services and products, so we're really big. We do a lot of things. 
the really important thing is we, do, we have a lot of data that we have internally, and we have a lot of data that we're looking at in markets. And we'll explore some of that as we go further. So in the marketing operations department where I'm at, we, have a, we use Marketo as our marketing automation platform. We have Salesforce as our CRM. We have three business-to-business -business units, two B2C. Again, the big takeaway is this. We have a lot of stakeholders internally, and we have a lot of buyer personas. So people want to know what's going on with their potential buyers and what's going on in the market. And of course, everyone wants to know it by like, cross-platform. So wherever people are, ads, social, website, events, all of it. Uh, and in marketing ops, we manage the tech stack so people can just focus on marketing. Uh, and we help connect individual, their platform data that they may work with to the broader business analytic ecosystem. Uh, and to kind of go over this whole idea of why marketing, why Python, uh, no one quite does dirty like marketing. Uh, you'll see a lot of marketing conferences, the huge tech stack. There's a lot of boutique firms that spin up. They're really great to solve a specific problem. Marketing is very disruptive. But many of these firms are looking to get bought by a bigger one. Uh, and they're trying to disrupt. And they're not necessarily worried about the relational tables in the back end. They're not always, they don't necessarily have normalizations built in. They're solving a very niche thing and looking to grow. But on the flip side, if, if no one does dirty like marketing, there's an argument that no one does insights like marketing. People want to know what do people think about our products and brand, or do they like what we do, or is it just the way we deliver it? Uh, where do they see us in relation to the competition? All these black box things, what's the customer lifetime value? These are very valuable if you can get uh, your finger on the pulse with these. So when we are connecting a lot of these data sources that you saw from the boutique stack, um, it's many great sources, but a lot of the same story. You end up with lots of baggage with these insights. Overly complex tech stack, uh, dirty data, no developers, they don't, have a, they don't have people who can help them whip their data into shape, and in general, you just have a lot of eager users who are very excited, but they're generally disconnected from the broader company reports and metrics. Some of the questions that come, by, come our way for marketing ROI uh, is engagement up or down. Of course, again, across every platform you could ever imagine. Uh, apparently, there's just a button. And then what about buyer persona engagement? So it's great that everybody, that you're getting a lot of traffic, you're getting a lot of engagement, but who's actually doing it? Is it somebody who's going to purchase our products? What is our database health? What's our progress in growing the marketing pipeline for new industries? Uh, what efforts are most associated with sales one, wins, and what should we cut? Uh, if, the, if the business is looking to sp expand in certain countries and regions, what is our potential for cross sales and new deals? What, can we, what is the marketing market telling us at accounts we may already have or at new accounts that suddenly they may be interested in products or there might be buyer personas that we didn't even realize that are very active on our marketing assets? Um, so a lot of this, when we're trying to bring in these new departments and new data that they're piping in, you know, they want to do a lot of transformations, a lot of different things, but ultimately all this data science, everything they want to do that's advanced will begins with cleaning this data. Uh, and many of the tools that are in that tech stack will lack the basic normalizations, as we said. They can't really data wrangle. And even when you can, out of the box is often not enough. These people... People, there's always business logic. There's always some type of way that you need to segment. Um, and having more control over that, well, we found will yield much better results. So we wanted to empower users to own and run their data cleansing and help connect them to the broader business reporting. But the big key here is you don't want it to hijack all of your time. We wanted to focus on constructing these Python tiles in ways that the code would be indestructible and people could use levers and ETL or other areas that they could then run these manipulations, but it's not going to crash. So for the sample project, we're going to just walk through some quick examples of normalizing data for any number of columns. Again, it's going to be determined by user input. And then we're going to archive and shape it for streamlined uh, card building from all on the same source data set. Uh, I'm sure, as you've heard from many sessions, there are many benefits to having it on the same data set, and we want to keep users, especially new ones, uh, contained in one area. 
So the big thing with Python and pandas, I just, just so I know, uh, when we talk about pandas, how many people are familiar with the pandas library? Awesome. OK, great. So one great thing about it is I'll just blow through it then, because these people pretty much know it is a library in Python. Uh, you're pretty much going to have to use it if you're going to use the uh, tile. It reads it in, a, it reads in your data sets as a data frame, which is a pandas data frame. It's just an object that, that lets you do all types of manipulations. Uh, but some good things, it doesn't care about the number of columns that you're going to normalize. It doesn't care about the values that users will designate in our sample, so they can say, I have five things that I want to segment. I have 500 things that I want to transform. That's fine. Pandas doesn't care. Um, you can add or delete columns in every way. It's not going to throw an error. I know that if some of us are more used to the SQL, it doesn't like if you're adding new columns on the fly, if you're archiving and shaping. Um, you can maintain Domo web forms. Um, they basically, we're going to use Python so that users can maintain everything around this tile. We're going to leverage the Domo ecosystem to kind of create a mini app user, excuse me, mini user interface for them without any coding. Uh, and of course, it's scalable for massive data storage. And with Python, there's just endless ways that you can take these core concepts and just make it your own and improve it and iterate on it. So, and the, the samples we're going to walk through are just going to be the basics in pandas. So the, the big takeaway, if you're new to pandas, is the first one. I used to do things with lists of lists, and it was awful. Just make sure that if you're doing, if you're iterating on millions and millions of rows, you're using pandas to do it. Do not do loops. It will break, and you will just not want to do it anymore. So that's kind of the big takeaway. All these other things you may be used to from SQL and other things, we'll get into them. But these are honestly just the basics. And just a quick word on SQL. Uh, this is definitely not a SQL versus pandas presentation. I've, I've heard that debate raging out in the halls, and that can just continue out there. Uh, this is just more Python lends itself to, the, to dirty data cleansing and to reading in inputs. It just lends itself to kind of hijacking what's going on already in ETL. Now, we may move fast with some of the code, uh, but it's all in the appendix as well in the slides. Um, along with different iterations of it. OK, so for step one, we're just going to create an interface for basic normalizations. So meet Janelle. She's our digital campaign manager, marketing ninja. Everyone in marketing is a ninja, clearly. Uh, and she runs the landing page optimi optimization tool. She's setting up hundreds and hundreds of iterations of different pages. Uh, hundreds of thousands of visitors. Globally, everyone's kind of starting to pipe into this. She's loving this tool. It allows you to put all types of creatives and really get down uh, in the metrics that, uh, and replace what is like the most optimized experience for users. It integrates directly with social. It does exist outside the main website CMS, because again, it was needed yesterday. It's not connected to the marketing automation platform, because those horrible people in operations don't do anything. And the direct integration will require development. So this contract's hung up for renewal. She loves this tool uh, and wants to see if they can expand it. So it's time to fire up the connector. So in this one, we're going to start with the basics. Obviously, we always want to tie things to behavior. But for purposes of this experiment or this uh, application, we're just going to look at demographics. Uh, and we're going to put the B2B hat on. Uh, and say, OK, we want to know certain job levels and certain job functions in certain industries, because those are where our buyers are. So if we look at some of the HR stuff in our company, we know that if you're not in the HR department, for instance, you're probably not going to subscribe to a multi-thousand dollar package. So we, Janelle is aware that some of the reports that already come out from BI, uh, the company has come down and saying, we need to target more of the tech industry. This is an initiative especially in China. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the APAC markets right now to get in touch with their finance contacts, get in touch with all types of people in the tech sector. That's a huge priority. She kind of has a target of where she wants to go. She's familiar with these reports. So we turn on the connector, and we look at things like job function. And right away, we're starting to see these annoying things that we're all used to. We have legal with a capital L, legal, all lowercase legal, all uppercase, or whatever crazy thing a user wants to put in, but also things like attorney, paralegal, 
it, it just goes on and on. And as we kind of look through, it just keeps going and going and going. And we have the long tail of doom. Now, we try it again for industry, and we're seeing some of the same problems again. There's healthcare all caps, because that person was in a good mood. There is financial, there is lowercase financial, and then again, another long tail. Now, I would never say that I take any joy from this moment watching someone's world fall apart. But the, the important thing is it doesn't go into the machine and come out perfect. And so we, are, we want to be able to offer Genoa a way to say, OK, if you just did the industry by job function right now, you're going to end up with this. And so if you're expecting those BI reports, you now have this like, I mean, it's kind of pretty, but it, it's just completely unusable. Um, so, and I know this as someone who has connected data sets and been like, I'm going to get this deal. This is going to be amazing. Everyone's going to want this technology. So that was actually my mosaic. It wasn't even Janelle's. Janelle's. So, you know, we're going to say, let's start working with a way to clean this up. So we're going, to ask the, we're going to ask her to input a list of acceptable values. So what are your target values for these different columns and dimensions? And in this first sample, we're just going to make them title case. And we're going to say, if they comply with the acceptable list, um, if, if they don't comply, rather, we're just going to flag it as uncategorized. So we're looking at a DOMA web form, and we're just saying, OK, list everything you want. So she's got job function there. We've got human resources, sales, marketing, kind of the, the usual suspects you expect, job level, C-suite, board. You know, These are different dimensions, and these are the ones that she's saying that they want to hone in on. So. When we're looking at uh, how we're going to build this, again, we have one Python tile kind of at the core of this. We're going to read in stuff that's coming from the web form. And in this case, it's Marketo, but it could be any data set that's coming through. And we're going to push them both into the tile. And so we need to get this in a data structure that Python's going to like. Uh, so for this one, we're just going to do a simple list of lists. So we're just going to say that each of these columns, of, you can see the code here, but basically the headers are going to be the uh, inner version. We're going to do a full list for all the others. And we're just going to loop through it, because now it's in a structure that uh, Python can iterate through. So you can get there many ways. The first one is through pandas. The second is kind of a Java-ish one, if you want that for reference. Um, I put some gotchas up here that are unique to either the tile or if you're new to pandas, um, some fun things like NAN is a float, which is not intuitive at first, but it makes total sense now. Um, but it will throw you tons of errors. So just if you end up looking at this and you want to get started, just take a look at that. But the point is, when you look at it, you got it in some type of data structure at the bottom here. We've got job function and then an inner list, job level, board, C-suite, vice president. Great. We can iterate through that. So, in this version, we're, we're now in a column. And this is where we're going to start using the power pandas. Like I said, you don't want to do four loops here. So we're just going to use its, it, the, its ability to kind of run its vector through. And with, with Python, you can insert such insane string manipulations and regular expressions. You can bring in other libraries. It, it's, kind of, it's just completely insane. But we're just going to start simple here. And so all this is doing is making title cast excuse me, title case. Then it's doing a Boolean mask, which is Panda's way of evaluating where to, where to target things. And we're then going to say, OK, if it doesn't meet these criteria, then it's uncategorized. So it's pretty simple. And so then we look at our output. And OK, it's not that great. We've got uncategorized data. It's huge. We made some progress with healthcare and financial. If we didn't have the flag there, we'd see at least, well, the title case collapsed all the capital letters and all that fun stuff. But again, this isn't very satisfying. But we've got the mechanism down. So we want to take it up a level. So we're going to look at dictionary replacement. So this is how we're going to say we can slay this long tail of doom. So we want to normalize words that contain a list of substrings. So I want to say, OK, finance and procurement, if, if it contains bank, if it contains finance, if it contains mortgage, all of that needs to be finance procurement. Same thing with legal. But Janelle can set this herself. And so in general, this is for more advanced users. And I don't mean coders. I mean folks that want to actually take ownership of it and, and create the structure and review what the results are. 
Uh, and I think in general, you want to start with simple streamlined rules. So what we're going to do is just all contains logic. We're not going to, we're going to ignore case. Uh, we're going to ignore it. We're going to say the order of values doesn't matter. You could go, again, any permutation you want that works for you. Um, but it can just get a little out of control at first. So let's just start with this is the rules of the universe right now. This is how it works. And we'll go from there. So when we talk about dictionaries, I just want to make sure, is everyone clear when I say dictionary? Does that if, raise your hand if dictionary, you're familiar with that? Cool. Awesome. OK. So what, what we're going to have here is the columns. We're, so we're going to try to look at our web form. We're going to say we have the target columns here. That is the outer dictionary, so you know, the headers of the formal web, former web form, so job function, job level, industry. And then here, this is what we want to normalize. Because every value in that web form, human resources, uh, sales, marketing, they're all going to have to have their own list associated with it. Um, so I saw uh, there were a bunch of people that didn't quite know dictionary, so I just let me just uh, give a crack at it. But it would basically be dictionary is just a, way to, a nice way to structure data. It's a very simple type that's not unique to Python. But it would be kind of like, OK, this is a long came a snake. And everyone here is the attendee. And then there's lots of other presentations, and they all have their set of attendees. And that could be your dictionary. But that could also roll up into all, that would be just Dome of 2019. There could be Dome of 2018. And if you go into that dictionary, it has all of its attendee, well, all of its um, speeches, and then all of their attendees. So they just nest very well, is the point. And once you can kind of get this framework, we have to revisit our web form, because this isn't going to cut it. So there are many ways to get there, but we're just going to go left to right. And so with this, we're going to have the first column be our outer dictionary, and we're going to run through. So if we just read, again, what Janelle is inputting, job function, so for that, finance and procurement, we now see the different versions she wants. So that should all normalize if it's finance, financial, CFO. Same thing for job function. Now we're in legal, and she's saying, OK, anyone that's legal, counsel, attorney, paralegal, great. So the code for this is like painfully simple. We're just going to, now that we have it in a nested dictionary, we can just iterate through it fairly quickly. Um, I have a note here that you can, that there's a, the thing with pandas is there's a million different ways to do it. You can do data frame dot string dot replace, data frame dot replace, series dot replace. So, you know, you can mix and match whichever ones you want. Some perform slower than others, so I would check that. But just the basic idea that we've taken something that a user can pretty much intuit in ETL. And in fact, you could just do this on a CSV file and upload it, that they are now able to execute a pretty powerful normalization. It's going to go through every single column and based on what their business logic is, bring it back and, and make those values. And then we're going to bring back our Boolean mask for each column. Again, you want to make sure that you're looking at the individual column, because if not, it's going to replace across the entire data. <clears throat> replace across the entire data frame. So in this final step, we bring back our Boolean mask. And we're just going to say, OK, does it meet the criteria of our original acceptable values? And if not, we want them as un uncategorized, because the long tail of doom does not let us do quick filters. It doesn't let us do anything fun, and it just kind of ruins everything. So when we look at the output here, now healthcare is looking a lot better. Financial is looking better. Uncategorized, still pretty strong. Um, but the good news is, with something like industry and other things, uh, you can just rinse and repeat this dictionary. So we've had users who just go nuts, and they keep adding more and more different iterations, and the long tail keeps shrinking. The, you're never going to get it 100%. But this helps users really take ownership of what's going on and start cleaning up what they're doing. So as I mentioned earlier, there is the kind of pandas mixer of everything that you're, uh, there's multiple ways that you can do things. I would just say for your own sanity, the key is how can you use something like a web form or different parts, because pandas will be able to read that in. The user can change the entire dictionary. She can change all those values. It's not going to throw an error. It's just going to output different things. Um, so it's extremely flexible, which we like. 
But if you ever do need to troubleshoot the code, you're going to want it in a data structure that you're used to. And we also know that Python and Pandas likes dictionaries, it likes lists. So a lot of the challenge or the creativity is just how can you get into a structure that Python can then iterate on, and then you're pretty much home free. So for now we have another project coming along. Here's John from events, clearly a ninja. And he owns all the training and workshops. The attendees are sometimes customers, sometimes not. It's not connected to CRM or the marketing automation platform. We know why. Uh, the events are expensive and drawing leadership's a lot of attention, so his boss has this great idea. OK, we're going to do a breakdown of 20 profile segments. Yes, I know the BI tool only, uh, that our standard BI reports only look at eight primary ones, but this is happening in new, there's entirely new markets that we're not tapping into. And these people are attending these events, and we need to show that they're there because there's new business growth. So there's not as much overlap with what Janelle is doing. And it's almost double the permutations. Uh, but John, who is a marketer of many hats, his day job is events, but he's got this great tool that he needs to justify the cost of. He's got his marching orders. We got to show that this is having all this impact against 20 people, or 20 segments, I should say. So no problem. It's the exact same setup. There's nothing different. It's the same Python tile for just a completely different use case. So we'll just let John work here. He can just either work in the web form. If he's not comfortable with that, he can just load, upload the CSV. OK. So as Janelle is working through it, she's making lots of progress and uh, slaying the long tail. Uh, and she says, well, what about the source database? Like, this is awesome that Domo is, getting, is cleaning everything, and all the data that goes up is cleaned through Domo. But you know, I've got lots of leaks in my database. It's, it's, got, it's producing lots of bad data that I can't really use. So she wants to find them. And the good news is this, this happens a lot when we're working with the Python tile, that people come along and say, oh, I'd love this other use case. And the work is already done in what, we already, in what we've already accomplished. So Python. We're already iterating through everything, so we just need to save the work that we're doing. So we're going to flag and save the erroneous data prior to those normalizations. And then for extra finesse, we're going to add some helper columns so that she knows where to look and where the problems are, and then add links to those bad records so she can check the source database and see what happened. Um, so again, all we're just doing is evaluating what we already did. Um, and we're just going to give users a second output where they can have uh, downloaded bad values data frame. So for that, we're going to modify our main loop. And in this version, we'll just build an array of bad, data, bad value data frames. So as it goes through each time, as it has the bad one, it's just going to add it and say, OK, I went through this column. Now I'm going to add that to the array, then add this column. And then at the end, the lovely PD that pandas can cat is just going, you just can pass it all in a list. Uh, and it will just do everything. And this is more to just showcase the benefit of PD concat. It, because it's pandas, because it's Python, you can just take list comprehensions. You can do all types of stuff. Your code can be very compact uh, and not really have to worry about what's happening. So great. There's our Boolean mask friend again. We concacted everything. Awesome. Here's a demo output of the table that we might see. So we know that we've set up a column that's, that flags where the errors were happening. And so we look at something like industry, industry conglomerate. That definitely looks wrong. OK, cool. Uh, we have a link to the source database. In this case, it was Marketo. But as long as people have a root link, you can just take something like the ID or whatever they use, and it's great. Oh, and one other thing with that is I was realizing that I was bringing data in that I could use these, the output of this to visualize what the source, what the data integrity was of the source databases coming in. So if there were uptakes, like if suddenly industry had a 40% increase in data that was not normalized or data that was dirty, uh, I could now monitor that. And I would not even have thought of that if Janelle didn't say, well, I want to track my source database. So thank you for that. Uh, other iterations that we've gone through is, well, I really want to control for all of this, and I want to know what's happening with my normalization. So can I see what the values were before and after? Can you group them? Can you do all this stuff? 
really simple. Uh, you're just going to save the column. And this way, people can say, well, was my normalization logic too aggressive? If I do VC, is it going to just replace everything or not? And again, really engage users, people who really want to take ownership of their data, love this stuff. They can really start to get it in shape, understand why it's coming in a certain way, and start normalizing. So we're going to go back to events, see how John's making out. So we have invalid call name, check the web form and data set schema. Uh, great, dictionary entry not located in the data set, so that row is skipped. Possible escape character, I take a quick look at his thing. Uh, this poor soul, it's just, it's just not working out. And so that's totally fine. Again, a lot of folks that are working on these cutting edge tools may not all be tech, they're wearing many hats. And so this is an SOS moment. And you know, yes, your boss told you to do all this, but we need to get you back to doing what you do best. This is not your thing. But the good news is Janelle already figured this out for eight key profile segments, or 10. And uh, John thinks that that will be just fine. So we can just take her values, her original web form, we'll use the same code, and it will, it'll get him 90% there. So it's the, the thing is it's really easy to clone this and give it to another department to have people share the benefits and to really just get pe a lot of folks just want to get traction so that they can get more investment, get more development. It's getting over that hump of, will the rest of the business invest? Will the business give development resources to really take it to the next level? So just to recap the normalizations, uh, we created an ETL section for users to set their normalizations and their replacements. Uh, we flagged the problem areas in the source data set or, or database. There was no upkeep. All the inputs are controlled outside of that Python tile. It's a clonable template. Uh, and we really helped users kind of own the data cleansing process and made some new friends. So if we turn it on to the other side to say, well, now we need to shape this data for card building. What are some fun uh, gems that Python and Panda can give us to let people at least visualize their progress and see how they're doing? So the ideal, again, is to be able to have quick filters. Uh, you can only do that with, when the long tail of doom is gone, but you want to be able to slice and dice by the different things and highlight the exact parts that you know that has come on high from the C-suite to say this is where we need to grow our business. There are two options that we can do here. This looks more complicated than it is. It's just to show both options. Um, the first one is fairly simple, and I just relegated that to the appendix. The, but we're going to go into the second one. We know from the BI folks that this is our desired input for card building. So it's just grouped columns. And it compresses the data, because we'll have people that are, when you're working with marketing, you have things that are tens of millions of rows. It just goes on and on. We need, they, then, they, of course, they want to data hoard it. And they're like, well, I need to archive it every day, which is ridiculous. So you need a way to compress this succinctly for them. And when we look at it, if you're used to pandas, this just looks exactly like a multi-index panda series. So we'll just go with that. Uh, it doesn't print well on the output console of the Domo Python tile, uh, but if you did it on your, your native machine or something, you know, this is what it would look like. Again, suspiciously familiar to what is ideal card building. And we're just going to do grouped counts. So this is just going to take the entire list that they designate. So that select columns tile is where they're going to choose what columns they want to archive from the data they're bringing in. And because pandas will accept anything, they can change the columns every day. So this will run, and it will just create a bunch of non-rows uh, beforehand, and then add the new column with no problem. And that's really key for a lot of users, because they change their mind a lot about what they want, and you're not dealing with something so fragile that it's just going to break. And if you go through this again, it's just pretty simple. It, it ends up being very easy to troubleshoot, and it comes out. Uh, you just have to reset the index of the multi-index series, and you've got your, your card building. So the benefits of this is it can shake off a lot of the normal pesky user wrenches. 
It really lets them start to explore their data. Uh, you can drop segments from these buyer personas, as we said. You can drop an entire dimension. So you can say, I no longer care about job title. I now care about uh, country or whatever crazy thing people will come up with. Um, the PD concat, as we went over, will accept and create new columns on the fly, which is always nice. Uh, you can support historical data from all these dimensions, and it keeps all the cards on the same data set. As you all might experience with new users, you'll get them saying, well, I need my country dimension card, and I need this other card, and it's just, it just spins out of control. So when we look at the results of the grouped column, we have lots of parano paranoid folks, so we want to just make sure, does it look exactly right when we scale for the compression? It's great. It's just simple grouping. Uh, but we can start to see the Python flexibility. Marketing ops was a value added later here. Great. I didn't have to do anything to that tile. Uh, here's where a new dimension was added. So number of employees did not exist at all. Uh, so they dropped one and now added this new dimension. Pandas added a bunch of nuns, which is what we expect, and then it starts to pick up where it went. And again, we don't have to do anything centrally to, um, to manage this. So we go some of the advanced applications for internal data. So for us, the marketing automation platforms, uh, especially to CRMs, they're going to require a lot of timely ac uh, actions and input across a lot of stakeholders. In some ways, the marketing stack one is uh, are great because it's just collecting a lot of data on visits and it's being logged by a machine and time stamped and it's all beautiful. The CRMs and the automation platforms require a lot of users using them, updating actions specific to them at the right time so that it can all make sense. So you're really dependent on internal users using it properly. There's lots of highly customizable objects and naming conventions, which means there's no naming conventions, and there's workflows, there's user roles and responsibilities. None of them are alike. They're configured specifically for your business uh, without any, if there's a major merger or acquisition, none of that was figured out, so then that has to be completely rethought through. So it's just a complete nightmare when they go south, as any of you who've worked with CRMs know, um, but it does rain money when it all comes together. So. Everyone also wants this ROI for reporting. They want to get to the CRM, or they want to get to the financial system so that they can show that they're making an impact on the business. So some of the things that you may be used to seeing in marketing attribution, but this can apply to multi departments. There's many stages. There's all these one wonderful funnels and different models. I love the ghost there, so I always have to have that, even though we don't have to talk about it. But there's like a life cycle. Uh, if you're not familiar with these systems, just in general, you're dealing with all these are customizable. It's set by these folks. It's set by the administrators or the business. And so things have to happen at a certain amount of time. And a lot of the ROI is dependent on, well, did they log? Did they update the opportunity? Is this sale related to all the marketing activity that happened? Well, it didn't happen. It happened after the person said it. Well, the person didn't update their opportunity until the day before they were like going to get a bad letter from their boss. So, or they didn't follow the naming convention, so no one has no idea if it's related to the same business unit that the marketing collateral or the marketing campaign was targeting or any other campaign that the business is doing. So we just go through a lot of things of how are these codified, um, how are they reshuffled in the latest rebrand, and, you know, if people aren't following a naming convention, how can we then make these associations? So. What we started doing was saying, in addition to our normalizations, we're going to run fuzzy matching. And Domo added the fuzzy wuzzy library to the Python tile. Um, and you can start to, set, you start to look at what is coming back. I think for us, it was 87. Uh, if it came back with a um, ratio of 87 match, uh, we could start to flag those and then start adding those to our dictionaries if, after a human kind of verified them using these same inputs that we're looking at with a web form. So with these advanced applications, the code definitely gets more dense, but it's all just variations on the same project. And I know it may seem very simple if you're a technical user, but you can really do a solid to 
the folks that are kind of on the front lines of these other tools. They're really passionate about them, they really like them, and they just can't get them into the broader business reporting. Um, and the key difference here is it's not really about the Domo admin or the person coding it, it's the savvy user and what they're able to do. A lot of these people, uh, they may not be technical coders, but they have logic, deep logic abilities, but they're also very close to the business. I don't know, necessarily know all the new initiatives that are coming out or all the new uh, campaigns and different things that we need to be doing. And the people that are close to this know exactly what the business is looking for. They can put in the logic and the web form, and they, they are actually well better suited than myself or someone that's in a central role to make this happen. The one thing is it's not for everyone, as we saw with the John example. Uh, the scaling, the sophistication of the normalizations. So we did the one where we said, let's just do title case, then let's do the dictionaries, then you know, fuzzy mash and other things. It kind of ends up being self-selecting. If people bomb out, that's totally fine. Another department can help them out, and they can just use theirs for that. Um, and a lot of this is just starting small and building traction uh, with, the, with the work that you're doing. So some takeaways with the design, just you, thinking about the different inputs that you can have around the Python tile uh, and making that tile as indestructible as possible. Just really taking advantage of Python's ability to read things in and just be flexible and also just keep it pretty simple because people will just love the ability to do that, this alone. And again, it, it's not the most intense code. Um, you, the, the big thing, we kind of touched on this earlier, is that you want to think about what is the data structure you need to get it in to make it work. So there are a lot of really fancy Python methods, or I should say pandas methods, that use dictionaries and nested dictionaries, so that's a fun one. But there are all types of ones, so there's many ways to win. Uh, I am sure people in the room com can come up with much more creative ways uh, and applications. Um, so it's really just leveraging pandas speed and flexibility, and just knowing that when you're inviting users to do this, anything delicate will break. And so when I say, like, oh, this is a mini app, it's, 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 you're giving them a mini application to, to run their normalizations, but you don't want to spend all your time with someone like John coming up with, well, let me come up with a control scenario in case they don't put the right column there. If they can't put the column name that's in the data set in the, in the web form, then that's not really a starting point. So if you start to build around that and start to build different ways to accommodate for that and turn it into an app, you're just going to frustrate yourself and the users. So go more with like mini app or hijack or something that sets the expectation to what it should be so that the, the, the savvy users can, can come forward and then share the benefits of what they're able to unlock. And finally, just keep the rules very simple. Uh, it's very tempting with pandas to start to put in all types of regex, but remember, your users have to input this. So as they're doing more, they're, they're understanding a dictionary structure that they're, they're putting in the columns. But if you're saying, well, it's going to replace, and then it's going to replace again, or the order matters, and you, the more that you give these different controls, yes, it could lead to more powerful normaliza normalizations, but it could also lead to a lot of frustration. So a lot of times, we'll just start with, this is the rules of the universe. And then if we need to expand beyond that, we do. And so we have certain things in our instance where you know, you can, if you write certain things, they're control statements. So in the case of title case, you could write, if ignore title case appears anywhere, that triggers a control. Uh, and then that's removed from the data frame and then it does its iterations. Well, you can do all types of stuff with that. You can put in ways that you want things binned. You can start to just put in controls that users have, but it's very, that, that is for very savvy users. And then takeaways on the culture side, uh, I just can't state enough how much to help user, users to own the data wrangling process. This is for myself as well. Years ago, when I had my marketing campaign manager hat on before technical stuff, um, that is what taught me to kind of really get down and understand how data is. And folks like Janelle, who are able to take their data, understand how dirty it may be, what is required to improve it, and then they're saying things like, I want to track what's wrong in the source database. I want to lock it down. For the it's like music to a marketing ops person's ears. So you would be very surprised at how much users run with it. Uh, Culture-wise, too, to keep the scope and expectations narrow. Again, the goal is entry into the BI ecosystem. They can dominate the world later, 
but we just need to get your data in shape so that it's not that crazy mosaic so that you can start to join what everyone else is saying. From there, you might be able to secure development dollars. You might be able to get people that can run way fancier transformations, and that's all well and good. But don't overstress the tile, because um, it ends up just causing all types of grief. Um, and as we said, let users share the love in a culture way. Um, it, it can be really great, as we saw in the John example, so, you know, a lot of people say, well, our department's not the same. My boss wants 20 uh, different profile segments because this is, again, going to take over the world. There's buyers we're not even looking at. Um, and again, no, department, no two departments are the same uh, until they are, and you actually can't execute all of that stuff. And it turns out that Janelle's stuff is just as good. Uh, so yes, RIP John and his ETL license. Uh, and the last thing is just to kind of get creative with Python. As you all know, there's many ways to iterate on this. And what I found is users, it sounds really cliche, but they're way more creative than you'll ever be because they're so close to the business. They know the logic to apply, and they're aware of all the initiatives that are uh, central to C-suite. So I want to respect the fact that we're at the last session, so I'll, we can wrap up here. Uh, like I said, there's lots of code in the appendix. And I just wanted to open up to questions at this point. When does the concert start is a fair question. <laughs> no one? OK. Well, I will be around if you want to talk more. Uh, thanks for your time, and thanks for coming.